Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, we'll get started now. Um, you might have, well, you've probably all heard of the One Laptop Per Child project, which is truly innovative hardware and software. Sridhar's deploying it uh, in Australia, and uh, yeah, it looks really cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, let me just reset my timer here. There we go. Okay, so my, my name is Srida Dunapallan. Um, I am the engineering manager at One Laptop Per Child Australia. Um, now, before before I get underway, um, I'll just give you a um, slight apology. I do suffer from asthma and I do cough from time to time. I'm not carrying the plate. <laughs> but uh, please be patient. And um, I, I would appreciate if we could leave questions till the end because I've got a lot to go through and it also helps preserve my throat. <coughs> Um, my slides are working, yes. Um, so, um, first, firstly I'd like to emphasize that uh, we, we are not old PC, we're old PC Australia. So I'll be talking about the way the program is done in Australia. Um, a lot of the approaches we, we take are um, unprecedented. They're, they have not been done anywhere else in the world. We have done a lot to adapt the One Laptop Per Child program to suit Australian conditions. Um, we, we happen to be a country that is um, that is first world, but you go out to remote areas, and there are many circumstances that are very very similar to the developing world. And, and in that sense, that makes us quite different from some of the other countries. Uh, we've had to adapt to governmental systems and and um, um, lo lo local conditions, and so on. Um, now, I'll, I'm going to start with a video because everyone loves videos. Uh, just a moment. Can people hear that? <clears throat> An ambitious program that's called for philanthropic attentions of some of Australia's biggest companies. The One Laptop Per Child organisation was formed in the United States five years ago to create an affordable educational device for use in developing countries. One Laptop Per Child is trying to boost numeracy and literacy rates in these remote communities, giving each child an educational laptop. So far, 1,500 laptops have been delivered to children in remote parts of the Northern Territory in Western Australia, with a plan to distribute 400,000 over the next five years. They're set up like a, a game. I mean, when they open them, it looks fun, it's engaging. They can see everyone else that's online, they can chat with each other, and they can play games with each other. And I think, yeah, that connection is really nice. A very big change where students would make use of these laptops because when they were given going to school and we didn't have to see and have these advantages for these children that have to have. One laptop per child program will just provide them with an exposure to new technologies so that they can um, use that technology for things that they are interested in doing. It's good to hear. The world ends here, but there's a big world out there. The programs on them are suitable for all ages, all learning styles as well. The students are going to take the EXO and they're going to take ownership of their own learning. I, th I think it's a, a powerful tool, it's a powerful resource. The students are, are just going to go full force with it. 
ways the world is working. If you want to get a job anywhere, especially it's off the more and so on, those kids are really going to have to have a really good understanding of technology. So I think in that way, it will really help connect them to hopefully future jobs. So the Managrida School has been somewhat of a technological revelation. With over 200 devices shared between the Hub School and the Homeland School, it's just been so exciting to see students and teachers engage with the EXOs. <laughs> they use the cameras, um, they look at their cell and like make funny faces and stuff, and like try not to laugh. They are having fun with it. Well, we'd like to say to the corporate partners that uh, have been involved in this program, we'd like to say thank you on behalf of the Wilmington State School of Care, on behalf of our children and the children of the other schools that are benefiting from this uh, initiative. Our children, while they are remote, need to be able to engage in these technologies so they have an equal chance as everyone else in Australia and the world to engage in the global economy. <coughs> So I hope that gives you some appreciation for uh, what we do, how our program operates in Australia and the difference it's been making to Australian children. And uh, now I can't spend too much time talking about how OPC started or what the fundamentals are, um, but I will quickly flash up the core principles that underpin the OPC program around the world. There are, there are five of them. Um, you can see the last one's free and open source, which is um, of course why we're here. Um, another difference that, that OPC does as opposed to other um, technology and schools programs is that we start as young as possible. Children are the most malleable, they're the most able to learn um, when, when they're really, really young. So, um, and, and also creating a sense of ownership is very important and making sure that every child has a learning device that and that none of them are left out and that they're able to connect with each other and learn, um, um, learn collaboratively. But on top of that, we've moved beyond that. We uh, in Australia have added two more core principles which are, have become very, very critical to what we do. Um, um, you, can't, you, you can't have any success with that, without these two in my opinion. Um, so first one, empowering teachers. Teachers are um, the core of a child's education when, when they're in the school. And you, you can't expect the school to implement any kind of educational program without um, buy-in from the teachers. So we put a lot of work into helping the teachers out, engaging them, uh, making sure that they're trained and um, of course that they like they, they like what we do. Um, but secondly, once the children are out of the school, they, they go back to their homes, they go back to their communities and um, um, the education should not stop at um, should not stop in the school. They, they should be able to learn at home, they should be able to learn with their family, their parents, their elders and so on. This... Okay, not not related to our talk anyway. <laughs> so um, I, I can't I can't remember if I I can't remember if I mentioned this at, at the beginning, but um, yeah, please leave questions and comments till the end. That will help us get through. Um, that that's that's a quote there from um, a particular member of the federal. Um, House of Representatives. Um, he's been quite supportive of our efforts. Um, that that quote was actually made in Parliament. It's in Hansard. I've got a couple of links down there. Um, the second one is to an article in the Australian newspaper, which was published only um, a few days ago on the weekend, where he elaborated upon that speech that he gave in Parliament a few weeks ago. Now, to talk about some of the um, success that we've had. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's useful to have some, some hard numbers. Now, real evaluation, real evaluation takes years to do, and we are actively engaged in doing that, collecting, um, collecting really, uh, really comprehensive information, engaged with professional researchers, um, the same researchers who do evaluations of educational <coughs> programs, technology and education and so on, um, in, um, in other programs in Australia. 
But this, this, is a, this is a small snapshot here, a case study in Doobagee State School in Queensland, where within a year, the um, NAPLAN results for year three pupils went from 31 to 95% uh, for those children who are at or above the minimum standards of uh, numeracy. Uh, that's a massive jump. Now, we're not going to claim entire credit for that. There's, there's no way that we're a silver bullet for anything. But, um, and Doomagee have done, a, have done quite a few really cool things. But I think one of the most significant things that they have done is very cleverly integrated technology, primarily through the use of the One Laptop Per Child Australia program. This is a slightly out of date map, about six months old, of a lot of the deployments where we, where we have been. Um, you'll see, uh, you'll see Doomagee up um, on the Gulf of Carpentaria there, um, and hopefully this gives a this gives a feeling for the the remoteness of these places that we go to. These are very very sparsely populated areas. This is the, um, the this is the something like ninety percent of the continent area wise that's not going to get um, not not going to get MBN. Um, they'll, they'll, be on, they'll be on satellite internet, that sort of thing. Now, the key to the, the key to um, ha having a program that actually works in these places is building sustainability. Because you can't um, you can't get people out there with expertise very easily. Teachers often don't last very long out there either. Um, you go to the Northern Territory, for example, and a teacher will. Um, yeah, it, a, a teacher might stay for eight eight months on average. That's that's a pretty that's a pretty common amount of time. So that's that's one school year, um, and that's not enough time for people who stay in these communities to actually get embedded and and um, seriously get a sense of what's going on. Uh, so we need to make sure that the communities themselves, the the children, the parents, and so on, are able to to fully take on the program for themselves and and drive it. Um, one thing we do is that when we uh, when we supply the EXO laptops, they they are they're fully costed for for a five year lifespan, and we we have spare parts and it's, and like I said, it's part of a comprehensive educational program, and that's that that's part of the funding. This is a new program that we're starting to roll into place. Um, <coughs> we have a series of certifications that. Um, Teachers, members of the community, um, children, and so on can go through. And perhaps most importantly, um, we don't su we don't supply EXOs to a teacher who does not have a certification. We make sure that they are um, that they are knowledgeable about a program and that they that they have the means to to see it through from from all aspects. Um, so f firstly, you've got the EXO ambassador. They're just people who, I shouldn't say just, but they are people who really embody the values of One Laptop Per Child Australia and they're able to, to spread those ideals to others. Um, then you've got the EXO expert and the EXO certified. Um, like I said, they're prerequisites for a teacher to, to receive their EXOs for their classroom. And the, um, the experts are able to train EXO certified people. So we're not... We are not the bottleneck here. We, we, the training doesn't have to come directly through us. We supply the means and the materials and so on so that the experts can train the certified teachers. And that way they can, they can take up the program for themselves. Then there are EXO champions. This is a children's certification. We want, to, we want to reward kids who have shown a lot of aptitude with using the EXOs and that, they, that the kids who are going around their classroom helping other kids and helping their teachers um, there are plenty of examples where kids pick up the technology faster than the adults. That's um, that's that's quite normal, actually, and um, so that should be recognised. On the on the hardware technician side, we've got EXO technician. They're adults who who want to repair EXOs, whether it be hardware or software. And then there's a corresponding child version, which is an EXO mechanic. Uh, EXOs have been designed so that they can be repaired by kids. There, we've thought of things like including <coughs> spare screws in the handle, and a lot of a lot of the parts just snap off because they're they're attached with clips, um, and there's no toxic substances or anything like that. Um, finally, there's the there's the exo local. Um, these are for members of the local community. 
um, they, they don't they don't need internet access to this course. The other courses are uh, mostly on, online. Um, they can the exo local um, candidates can go into their their library and will have videos available for them, and they can just watch them. And there's no um, there, there's a there's a very low standard required for for English literacy and that sort of thing. Okay, so connecting the dots, how do we make this happen? I, I alluded to online training, so that's the um, that's that's the third point there, the online course and forum. And but we also have a store where people can buy spare parts. We have an education portal, which is where people go to first. And that that that's that's your your non-stop shop, so to speak. You you go there, and that links to that links to everything else. We want teachers to form a a network of knowledge sharing. We want them to be able to to help themselves as much as possible and. Um, like I said, not be dependent on us. Um, we do have we do have support available through us and also um, with resources in the departments of education and training. Um, but we encourage them to to help each other first. Um, there's a saying we like to say: "Ask three before me." So if a teacher or a child has a problem, ask three other people around them first before before they ask the you know the expert, so to speak. Now for the cool stuff. Well, everything's cool, but in a in a geek conference, um, you can't really not talk about technology. This is the motherboard for an XO 1.5, which is the model of XOs that we are deploying at the moment. We happen to be the first country in the world to deploy these, um, and we've been doing so successfully for uh, almost a year and a half now. And this is the technology that underpins the program, what the program is built around. Firstly, there's the XO. The XO is um, I'm sure most of you have heard of it. It's 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 um, a learning device. It's made to be rugged, reliable, cheap. Um, the, the express purpose is that every child owns one, um, can be field repaired, um, long lifespan, last five years, including the battery, which is something you don't you don't typically see in consumer devices. <coughs> this is some of the stuff we're doing in Australia. Um, this is our XO. AU operating system, what we've done is we've taken the old PC operating system, which is based on Fedora, and we've made it much more um, much more relevant to Australian communities because the stuff that's done at the old PC global level, because they're aiming for a worldwide audience, they can't specialise too much. Um, we've, we've done things like added local content, we've picked activities, um, activities of the programs, by the way, that we expect that we really want children to use. Um, we want, um, we've picked activities that um, are as relevant as, as we can make to the Australian school curriculums, curricula. And uh, another thing we, we do is that we include the GNOME interface because now we're, we're, targeting, we're targeting primary school children, so effectively ages 4 to 12. And we, but we hear from teachers that as the kids get older, they don't want the baby interface. They want, they, they want something that's a little bit more grown up. So as a, as a choice, we supply this, and um, there, there, are some, there are some tasks that, that work out a bit better, and as kids get older, they might want to muck around in, uh, say, GIMP or Inkscape or something, some, something that's more capable than, than the um, child-friendly activities that you get on Sugar. Uh, the XOA USB is a means of delivering the operating system um, it is, and but most importantly, what what I like to call it is a Swiss Army knife for uh, for anyone in the community. It's it's not actually it doesn't have to be a physical item. That's how it looks if you happen to order one from us. But all it is is a big zip file you download from uh, a server and you just extract it to any standard FAT32 formatted USB stick. Um, so it's very easy for anyone in the field to make. We assume no technical knowledge. Uh, if you have to. If, with anything, if you have to open a command line or type something in, it's inappropriate. Um, so this this is bootable. You stick the thing in the in the XO. You turn it on. You get a menu of what things you want to do. Option one is flash your XO. Um, option two is NAND Blaster, which is a very 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 cool way of having one XO wirelessly broadcast and reach to other XOs to pick them up. And that way you can. That way, you can flash many XOs in one go with <coughs> one USB stick. Um, you can also run hardware tests and diagnostics. If you think there's something wrong with your XO, you can run these tests 
and and that will that will tell you which uh, which components are working and which ones may may not be working as well as you would expect. Um, there are some things that are done silently in the background, such as upgrading firmware, stuff that people really, really shouldn't have to care about. Um, but what's what's most important is that simple. And also, we don't lock down these exos. We w we want these to be as open as possible, which is a big difference in the way IT is often done in corporates or in well, often how it's done in schools. They they're often bubble wrapped and locked down and all of that. Um, People and children especially learn best from when they can do whatever they want, when they can experiment. Uh, they should be allowed to fall over. There's nothing wrong with that because when you fall over, you learn to pick yourself up again. And that's that's what the XOA USB lets you do. Because if you stuff up the operating system, and we don't we don't even block root. If you if you stuff up the operating system, that's fine. Just pull out a USB stick and reflash the thing. Seven minutes later, it's as good as new. Now, that's all well and good to say every child has, has a um, learning device, but how do you charge the darn things? And that's something that was not factored into building designs. Even buildings built 10 years ago um, um, didn't, have as an, didn't have as a core part of the construction an electricity system that could handle every single um, child with a device that needs charging. Now, the exos, of, of, exos require very little power, which means we can have a very cost-effective um, charging rack. And that's what that's what the XOP is. So, if you look at the if you look at the picture at the top, that's a that's a completed XOP there. That's two units plugged in together. It comes in parts. It just snaps together like Lego. Um, and the picture on the bottom shows how they fit together. So you've got these power bricks that just daisy chain onto each other, and then you have one power cord, only one, just coming out, going into one power point, and. Um, that lets you charge over 50 XOs on, on your standard Australian electrical system. Um, 50 in one go, one PowerPoint, um, and it, it, it's, it's neat, it's safe, it's affordable, it lets the XOs sit in the classroom and there's less need to put them off to some separate computer room where they get forgotten about. Um, it, it's, they, they just sit in the classroom like, like books water on a bookshelf and they become a very um, they're, they're able to become a very critical part of the classroom experience. Now, XSAU. Now, this is software, so I don't have a picture. I don't know how to drop diagram software in a, in a way that would actually look pleasant. Um, so, this this is a this is a server element. It again is based on Fedora, as as is all of the old PC technology. Um, XOs can talk to each other over the network. Um, quite automatically. Um, that's very, very important because we want children to be able to collaborate and share, do things together, um, learn, play, all of that. Now, that um, when you start doing that, you hit network bottlenecks. Exos don't require any form of wireless hardware to be around. They can talk with each other quite directly. That has limits of maybe five or ten Exos. Then you might put in a wireless access point, and that gives that gives you more scalability. But then, when you start to think about whole classrooms and then whole schools, you really need something to to marshal the services, and that's what the XSAU does. We've taken the old PC access, we've we've made it we've made it more modular, we've made it work well with Australian school networks. That's that's really really important. It's easier to install, so that it's just a USB file. You can configure the installation via Kickstart, so you have a headless installation. And so we can we can actually ship out pre-configured USB sticks to teachers. They can get a, a an old desktop computer that wasn't really doing much and slam the stick in, turn the thing on. The XSAU just gets installed. So you don't have to worry about it. The the traffic that the the, the protocols that the XOs use to talk with each other is XMPP. So it's essentially a a Jabber server that is handling the 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 um, uh, collaboration traffic. Moving on from there, now localization. Now, really, really, really important to make sure that these things feel relevant to people. Uh, you don't want to get something that was that's very, very genericized for a world for a world audience and just voice it on someone because it's not going to feel like it's theirs. So we've been putting a lot of work into into um, creating local content, making making this content available, encouraging communities to create their own as well. Um, it's quite easy with the XO given that it has a camera on it and a microphone. Um, and that that should hopefully help us build grassroots support. 
Now that's an interesting character there. <coughs> that's not on your standard Latin keyboard. That is a character from the language Yomomata, which is which is used in Northeast Arnhem Land. That character is actually available in a lot of major fonts. It's just a Unicode character. These are the kinds of things that we just need to pull out because there's a lot of existing stuff that's already there. Um, oftentimes, it, oftentimes it's not just as, it, you don't have to create your own. Um, we're look, so we're looking to leverage things like that through having um, perhaps custom keyboards and, and things like that. Now this is where we start talking about the future. Uh, the XO175 is the next model. It does look basically the same as the existing XOs, and there's a reason for that because that's a very successful form factor. It's proven itself in the field. There are already uh, a few million XOs out there, so why, why change what works? What has changed? What has changed is the, um, the innards. The platform is now based on the ARM architecture. In fact, it's a uh, Marvel Armada 610 system on a chip. Um, it's much more power efficient. It's um, cheaper to produce, and it actually, in terms of power efficiency, nice little, um, nice little fact: it can actually run off solar. Now, the distinction being, if if you didn't pick up on that, is that. A lot of devices can charge off solar, but the minute you turn it on, the power draw is too much for the panel to provide, and you just run your batteries down anyway. Um, this can actually run off solar. And a couple of new features, there's a seismograph and... Sorry, not a seismograph. A, you can use it for a seismograph. My notes are bad. It's an accelerometer. Uh, <laughs> I had a seismograph demo, which I... Um, I, I I actually changed, but um, it's it's accelerometer and a, a light sensor. So that that's um, and and it's it's all it's all accessible and programmable to the child. That's that's very important. There's no point in putting all this complex stuff in if the children can't actually get to it and pro and code for it themselves. Um, now beyond the 175 is what old PC are designing um, called the XO3. That is a pure touchscreen device. We want to we want to get ready for that. We want to uh, we we want to have the the software in place for for that touchscreen to be a really really good um, tool to use in the classroom. And to facilitate that, what we're doing is that we're getting XO one seven fives and we're effectively retrofitting um, touchscreens onto them for development purposes. The one seven five and the XO3 have the same hardware platform underneath, which means that if you can get something working well on the 175, it shouldn't be too much more work, if any, to get it working on the XO3. So what I'm going to show you, if I can flick over to the document projector here, um, document camera, Here we go. Okay, do I need a microphone over here? Or am I being picked up? Everybody here in back. Or I can get this over here. Maybe that helps. Hopefully it comes up on the video. Now, this... There is another microphone. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the video is fine. It picks up pretty well, just ambient. So, uh... Okay, fine. That's great, thank you. Um, we have a, an XO175 here. It looks just the same as an XO1.5. We open it up. A few differences here. Um, one, thing, one thing we're looking to deploy in the field, we're currently in the stages of evaluating, is uh, a different kind of keyboard. You can see this is, this is a mechanical type of keyboard. It is not the, the rubber variety that we have been using. And that's why we're evaluating it. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very good point, and we are actively considering it. Um, but an, another another good point about the keyboard is what we're thinking about uh, printing on the keys is lowercase letters. The reason the reason being is that um, now you you look at your standard keyboard; they've got capital letters on them. For children who are pre-literate. Um, 
when they press an uppercase key and they get a lowercase version on the screen, that's really, really confusing. And they don't necessarily have that mental mapping between uppercase and lowercase um, at, at that point in their development. Um, we are also looking to, for the for the glyphs on the keyboard, to be using the same fonts they use for literacy in Australian schools. They have specific fonts. Now, that's where things get hairy because each state and territory seems to have its own font. <laughs> have to be one. <laughs> um, so, I'm welcome to. Use your comic Sans. <laughs> <laughs> comic Sans, please no. <laughs> um, and we're, we're also we're also looking to remove some of these some of these things like the let's see, Omega. It's not really useful for the children. Um, now, that's all well and good, but. What what makes what justifies the sticker here that says prototype? Well, what I'm going to do is flip this around and run my finger around, and you can see it's a touch screen. Now we have made we have made zero changes to the software to make this happen apart from the touch screen driver. This is sugar as it is, and the reason the reason why is that sugar is nice and iconic. It was made for kids who are preliterate and kids who like big things to click on, uh, which gives us quite a, quite a nice base to work off. I can, I can do stuff like, uh, let's see, if I was to drag over to paint, and start a new one. I'm going to turn off the light because it's, uh, I think we're getting some glare. Is it too? <coughs> there we go. Now the um, we're we're going to be working on removing the glare. The standard exo screen doesn't have one, but like I said, this is a prototype. But I can just draw like that. Um, sure, you get the point. Uh, simple educational games like Implode. I can go. And I think I failed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, physics is particularly cool because you actually uh, there's actually a physics engine in here, so I can draw shapes with my finger and watch them fall and interact. So this is um, this has proved to be quite a quite a useful tool in the classroom. Um, and now I have to switch back to the keyboard because, like I said, it's not a fully touch-friendly interface. And I will go into what needs to be done to make that happen uh, in a moment. Uh, This is eToys, which is a squeak, small talk environment that is designed for children. And what we're doing here is with a relatively simple squeak program, you can control the accelerometer. Well, I, I, I have I have visions of having a child on, on either side of the screen dragging the pong, um, playing a two-way pong game, dragging the rackets around. I would take which child would have that. That too. Yeah. <laughs> that too, but I was thinking of how we can leverage the touch screen more. So oh, yeah, yeah. That, that was what I was getting at. <laughs> um, so another example here of how we need to do work on touch screens. I can't really press that too well with my with my finger, so I'm just going to switch over to the pad again. So I hope you get the point. Um, there's a there's a lot there's a lot of possibility here, um, and we we want to be we want to be ready for the XO3 when it comes out. We want to accelerate this development, which is the cool thing is that a lot of this development is already happening in the free software world. Um, let me switch back to my projector. Any thoughts of um, the stylus or writing? 
Yes, it's a capacitive screen. We need a capacitive stylus, but that would be very good for handwriting, <coughs> for instance. Um, that's, there, there's all sorts of possibilities here, and what we want to do is put the framework to make this possible. Um, what we what we would need is that stuff. Uh, firstly, I've bold, I've made bold educational contributions. Now, the reason for that is that, to be completely frank, the the weakness in the sugar community is the disconnect between hackers and educators. Um, I came into OPC as from the hacker side of things, and I, it took me a long time to understand the perspective of, ed of educators. I had to spend a lot of time with them, talking with them, um, work, and, and and now I'm in this position where I can facilitate their needs through through technology. What I'm offering here is to be a conduit for the hacker community with the educational sector. We, I, I I've got I've got a lot of ideas have compiled over time. Um, we have. We have online means of communicating with teachers. We have an online social network, which is one of, on one of our previous slides, where we have where, where we have hackers directly talking with teachers. And we've had some really cool examples. Like, for instance, one teacher who's working out in northeast Arnhem Land was like, how ha, he was trying to look for a way to teach children money because they're in such a remote community they don't see money at all. And in the past, he'd done so with Microsoft PowerPoint. So he he asked, okay, is there a PowerPoint equivalent for the XO? Now there is, but we probed deeper and we worked out exactly what he was trying to do. And uh, Walter Bender, who is the, um, the the main fellow behind Sugar Labs and also the author of the Turtle Art activity, wrote a plugin that that allowed you to dra firstly drag and drop currency, but also apply that to logo operations do calculations and things like that. So that's the kind of out-of-the-box thinking, that, that kind of out-of-the-box stuff that can happen when you bring educators together with hackers. Um, so if, if you are interested in, in giving back to education, if you're interested in, in doing so in a free software manner, then, then I, can, I can help that happen. And please contact me. Um, my contact details will be on the last slide. Uh, next, sugar activities. Um, should, well. Sugar is mostly done in, in Python. Most activities are done in Python. Um, there, are, there are other languages you can use, and you can just have a you can just have a sugar wrapper, uh, sorry, a Python wrapper to make it interact with sugar. Um, but the, what we're really after is stuff that's collaborative, allows kids on different exos to talk with each other over the network and learn and share and play together. Fedora 17, that's what we're targeting for this development. That's six months from now. 16 just came out the other day. Um, and 17 is where a lot of the really cool architecture stuff happens in touch because um, GNOME 3 has been out for a little while now uh, and you'll see when, um, a bit further down that we need to port Sugar to the GNOME 3 platform. Where Sugar is currently based on GNOME 2 and there's no touch stuff in GNOME 2 or at least there's no good touch stuff in GNOME 2. GNOME 3 is where the action's at. So we're in the process, the process of doing that porting and um, any, any help and suggestions would be would be welcome. Um, we because we're also supplying GNOME and we'd be moving to GNOME three. We would need to support some three D acceleration for GNOME Shell. Um, now I know there's software rendering. You can't really do that very effectively on a mobile CPU. You need something quite chunky. Um, and to do that, you would need to port GNOME to OpenGL ES. The if you're unaware of the difference, OpenGL is the is a large superset of 3D graphics APIs, and ES is a subset <coughs> for mobile devices. But this, um, like I said, this is the kind of stuff that the free software community needs anyway. We just want to make it happen sooner in, in a six month time frame rather than a one or two year time schedule. And this is what will uh, underpin the XO3. This will make it a really really compelling device when it comes out. Um, then, now it's all well and good to have the infrastructure there, but you need a good user experience. Um, our hardware is multi-touch capable. We need to think about how that affects how Sugar operates. Um, uh, there are some there's some um, elements of the Sugar UI, as you've seen, that aren't very touch friendly. Uh, we're working on that, um, but we'd like that to get better. WebKit, WebKit is interesting. We'd love to we'd love to envelop that a lot more. 
the current the current browse activity is based on an old version of Firefox, old Gecko Engine, and it's it's a separate browsing experience. You load that when you want to browse the web. We would like to make web technologies just integral to Sugar. We would love it so that you could you could just use HTML5, JavaScript, that sort of thing, just to just to create activities. Um, and then we can teach kids, and then, and then kids can jump from that to web development or whatever they like. But there's there's a lot of really good tools already out there that create web stuff, and we if we can leverage those to make sugar activities, we're we're instantly opening sugar to a wider world. We're we're allowing more developers to get into it, and allowing more kids to get out of the sugar world into the into the wider world as well. Now, last thing, but certainly not least, testing and quality assurance. I hope that's enough said on that point. <laughs> um, that prototype I had sitting there, we're getting a whole batch more. And so if people are interested in hacking on this stuff, please talk with me and I'll see if I can get you one. They'll probably be arriving in the next couple of months. Uh, we, we're, we're, we'll be loaning these with a $100 refund, fully refundable deposit. Um, simply because we need to keep track of them, um, and um, because that because they're of a limited run, being prototypes and um, not being mass manufactured, we have to be very selective about whom they go to. So just talk with me, and um, uh, 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 unless you want to do something that's totally unrelated to children, I'll probably say yes. Uh, now, question time. No? <laughs> yes? In Australia, are they doing anything like the Give One, Get One program that was run a couple of years back, where you pay twice as much and uh, a student somewhere gets an OLPC and the contributor gets an OLPC to play with and hopefully develop uh, more stuff for the, the community? We get that question a lot, and you know a lot of people like to would like to get a hold of an XO, and um, I'd love to make that happen. Uh, the plans are at the moment not not at this time. We are actively um, we're actively evaluating that option. Uh, we have to do so in a way that doesn't affect our current program. Um, the the danger is that it can it can be a distraction from what we're trying to do in the education space, um, particularly around logistics and support when you're moving from shipping lots to shipping them one at a time and then consumers consumers having an expectation around around kinds of, um, the kinds of support they'll get. Um, if we are to do it, then I, I think we would have to do so very carefully and make sure that people actually get a good experience and get some some uh, little bit of value from, from their money. So we, w we wouldn't take that decision lightly. The Australian program is also heavily funded um, and sponsored by corporate. Yes, that's a good point. That's that's very true, and uh, and we're, we're we're transparent with our with our money. There's actually our full policy <coughs> document available on our website if you want to go and take a look. Uh, but in term in terms of funding. Most of it does come from from donations, um, particularly from from corporates. Um, there's a whole list of logos on our website. I won't start advertising here, but the um, the basic funding breakdown is it's three hundred dollars Australian dollars for the cost of the hardware that includes the the XO and the the charging rack, um, and that that is what's funded by the sponsors. And then the school puts in eighty dollars, and and that will. That, that covers the cost of the training, the ongoing support, um, spare parts, and a few other bits and bobs. Um, so that, um, and then how the school chooses to raise that money is up to them. And in a lot of, in a lot of cases, they may get that money through fundraising or government grant or some such thing. Yes? So are these child owned or school owned? It depends on the community. We would love them. Uh, on, on one of my, on one of my first slides, I, I had the list of old PC key principles and, um, I think the first one was child ownership, um, and that's a goal we'd love to have. We want every child to actually own their device because there's a big difference in, in your mind 
when you own something as opposed to thinking, oh, I'm loaning this, I have to be careful with it. Or, or I'm, I'm loaning this so I don't care about it. You know, people think about things in different ways. But that's, that's one of those things where we have to be very flexible. It's up to the community, the school, the teacher, um, uh, to, to work out for themselves. And they'll learn that over time. We've seen some communities where, where when we first gave them the EXOs, they were very, very protective of, of them. And as they saw the success of the program, they became more liberal with them and they let the kids take them home and all that stuff. So, so they are letting them take them home now. They're they're, them there are communities that are doing that, yes. I suppose with how we deal with time and they um, the schools do get an allocation of spare parts and um, with the training and everything we, we make sure that they are capable of doing the repairs themselves um, they can buy more through our online store so there's um, um, they, they have everything they need to make it happen and if they if they um, still need help they can they can always talk with us How are you guys doing impact, impact on this? Is like, there are lots of applications, but what impact is it making to kids and teachers and the whole education process? Are you doing any kind of reporting or things like that of how the development has been for a particular kid? For a particular child? Um, well, that's, that's not our business. That's up to the teacher. We don't have that, we don't have that information. Um, uh, it, that's um, the teacher has to make that assessment as to how the child is going, and there's a lot of local elements there, um, and this is why we have to give a lot of autonomy to to the communities because they're they're all so different. Each each um, community is different. Each child is different. Um, what, um, like I said, we we try our best to enable them to make those kinds of judgments. That's the best we can do. I think that's the best solution, in my opinion. Yes. When you introduce these machines into the uh, communities, how many people do you go out with this initial deployment? Do you send out like ten people, or do you you just send out a couple of people? Or, you know, how do you go out manage managing putting this into a new community? We do it entirely remotely now. We used to we used to have people going out to communities, um, and that was successful to a point. I think uh, I, I think where that where that doesn't work as well as we would have liked it to is that it builds a sense of dependence. You go out, you set everything up, you spend some time with the teachers and frankly you don't get much time with the teachers because they're really busy with their day-to-day -day, um, teaching. Um, and then you leave and the community is left crashing their heads. Um, I don't think it's fair to them to do that and it's really expensive when, you, when you're talking about how many communities there are in remote Australia, um, how sparsely populated the country is how far apart those settlements are. Um, so what we do is we have the online training model, we go through the school systems, the departments of education and so on, the teachers that are um, interested and willing to get involved, they will go through the online course. To do the course, we, we uh, give them two XOs. We give them two because we want them to experience the collaborative as aspect of it. And once they're through the course, then they can receive their classroom allocation of exos, and that's another uh, that's another distinction here between the way OPC is done here and the way it may be done in other countries. We don't we don't do full school deployments. We don't want to overwhelm the school in one go, and we want to make sure that each teacher individually is on board with with the concepts and is comfortable with the situation. Yes. Um, sorry, odd question. How do you can you mentioned the price earlier, about three hundred dollars per unit. How do you compete with the sub laptops which are out these days, which are about three hundred dollars per unit? I think the simple answer to that is a netbook, for example, probably wouldn't last five minutes in a remote community; it would just break, <laughs> and then you would be very reliant on the vendor to repair it. Um, now, that's the that's the technological angle. The educational angle is how do one of those devices actually give a child an education, and if there's no educational program around it then what's the use? Yes? Have you seen any sort of um, community spring up amongst the users themselves? Are they talking to each other, sharing hacks and ideas and stuff like that? They are. Um, we, we have, um, in the last few months, started a social network 
um, which is if you've been to Yammer, that's, that's what it's based on. Um, so it's very Facebook-like, and we've got teachers from around the country just sharing ideas. Um, it's really cool, and because we're getting um, because we're getting hackers involved as well, we have that flow of communication between teachers saying, "Yo, what? You know, this is my problem," and a hacker going, "Oh, I can create a solution to that." So um, it's that really cool interface where, from a hacker's perspective, you're actually creating something that you know can be useful in the classroom, and you can. Um, you can actually get feedback from the teacher, so you can go, hey, I've coded this thing up, would anyone like to try it? And then the teacher tries it and it gives their feedback and you can make it better. Yes? Are there any plans to introduce this into uh, metropolitan schools where I can see something that is much better than certain commercial solutions that are being done? Uh, we, we, we do have a... Um, we do have a fully funded track. I can't remember the precise name for it, but for schools that are really, really interested and they're willing to pay full price, um, then we, we're willing to talk with them. Uh, which is not something we used to do, but um, hey, if someone's going to pony up the money, then fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Have you had much support from um, government organisations that may be involved in education, especially in remote areas? We... It depends on the area. Um, uh, um, most most of the discussions we've had have been with um, uh, departments of education and training, um, and we've got you know, various levels of take up in in each state and territory. Um, there are there are local bodies, and we'd like to encourage that a lot more because we we try very hard to be a grassroots thing. Um, what what tends to happen is. You start off with one or two people who get involved in the program, and as the other people in the community see the success, they jump on board as well. And um, that, um, and and then other communities start seeing other, other communities in the general region might start seeing that and they're going, "Hey, we want to get involved as well." Um, we we have had some support from the, I think it was the educate Australian Education Union. I think that's the word for it. There is um, in one of my previous slides, if I can um, if I can find that. Are you still going through um, the actual state education bodies? Is that correct? Still working there? That's that. That is correct. Um, yes, we we are we are openly courting the federal government, and um, we reckon that our um, our program is very cost effective. We worked out at um, with with each XO having a total cost of ownership of three hundred and eighty dollars. You can do fifty thousand for I believe nineteen million. Which is chicken feed in, in when you factor in how much money is spent in education in this country. Um, if you go to the second Bitly link at the bottom, that is a that's a link to a well, it's actually a link to a Google search, which links to a, an article in the Australian, thanks to their paywall, and um, uh, that 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 is a longer <coughs> article from what Rob Oak shot, which which goes through um, some of some of our um, most compelling points. In, including costs and um, some of these supporting organisations. Yeah, probably a little bit pressed for time here. Uh, one more question, maybe. Well, um, just to just just to cap off, then uh, I'll just skip to the last slide again. Uh, if you if you are interested, I'm I'm here for the rest of the conference, and. Um, you can, by all means, send me an email. So, thank you very much.